Yes. Okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to UCSL webinar series number six. Um, trust we are all keeping well and safe and abiding by the safety protocols issued by relevant government authorities and health agencies. The theme of today's webinar is uh, financial and work management. The running day is upon us. The global COVID-19 pandemic has left governments, individuals, and corporates a dilemma, particularly as to how to manage their finances and to meet not only their current needs, but future obligations. The pandemic which came upon us without notice has more or less emphasized the age-long imperative of planning for the proverbial running day. Indeed, many have emphasized that the economic pandemic engineered by the current COVID-19 pandemic will have far-reaching effects and consequences on the globe as it came unawares without fanfares and took many countries, businesses and individuals by surprise. For some, the devastating effects of the pandemic can better be imagined than experienced. So there is no doubt that the pandemic will have wide ranging and severe impact on businesses, whether small, medium, or large, financial markets, governments, corporates, and individuals. However, more worrisome is the coincidence of the current pandemic with Nigerians dwindling revenue from oil and its derivatives, owing to the fall in the price of crude oil, which itself is impacted by the current global pandemic and the looming trade wars between US and China. So there's no doubt that all these have serious impact on the finances of governments, corporates, individuals, and calls for re-strategizing and redirection of corporate goals and initiatives. I can do it for my end if I can do it. One significant area that requires urgent attention for individuals and businesses is financial management, particularly the need to take careful consideration of available investment options within the context of the current economic uncertainties and looming recession. So there is no gain saying that given the prevailing circumstances, companies, individuals, and governments need to manage their works optimally to ensure that they come out strong are more viable after the pandemic. Today's webinar will focus on sharing financial and wealth management tips and providing the participants with information on investment options, opportunities available to them. To achieve this, we have assembled a panel of subject matter specialists and wealth management experts who will provide insights on the impact of the current pandemic and the ensuing new normal on our finances, whilst buttressing the importance of wealth management and planning. The panelists will be sharing their thoughts, knowledge, and experience on cost management techniques to provide both business managers and individuals with insights as to how to manage operational costs, expenses, and other ensuing matters. So it is my pleasure to introduce our panelists at this point. First, and in no particular order, it's Mr. Kintola Wolabi. Uh, Mr. Tola, as he's formerly called, is a professor of cost management and management accounting at Lagos Business School, otherwise called Pan Atlantic University, Lagos, Nigeria. Mr. Tola brings over three decades of industry consulting, research, and academic experience to his teaching, research, and cost design responsibilities at Lagos Business uh, School. Mr. Tola's areas of concentration include tax planning and management, corporate financial accounting, strategic cost and management accounting, business statistics, environmental accounting, and financial modeling. Mr. Kintola researches and consults actively to a wide range of firms in the aforementioned areas. He has also published widely in international and professional journals and presented papers in conferences across the world. Mr. Tola, as we fondly call him, started his career with the audit unit of PricewaterhouseCoopers, PwC, and later moved on to the University of Lorraine, where he was a senior lecturer. He serves on the board, on the editorial board of ICANN Journal of Accounting and Finance, with responsibility for maintaining the quality and standards of accounting in Nigeria in line with global standards. Professor Tola is a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria, 
and an associate of the Chola Institute of Taxation of Nigeria. It's my honor and privilege to welcome you, Mr. Chola, to this webinar. Uh, good evening, audience. It's a pleasure to be among you guys this evening. Uh, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Next is uh, Mrs. Kai Oga. Kai is the Managing Director of ARM Investment Managers Limited. As the MD, she's responsible for providing strategic leadership for the company by collaborating with the Board of Directors and Executive Management Committee of the holding company to establish long range goals, strategies, plans, and policies. Prior to her appointment, Kai joined ARM Investment Managers in 2013 and served as Vice President and Head of Business Development, North and Portakal Regions, where she has primary responsibility for managing the firm's relationship with individual clients. Kai's experience in financial services spans over 20 years, starting as a banker at Continental Trust Bank, Reliance Bank, later, which later became Sky Bank and now Polaris Bank, and later 10 years at Standard Chartered Bank, where she was instrumental in establishing and broadening the regional business and establishing new branches in several locations. Kai's experiences cover financial planning, wealth management, sales, business development, customer relations, credit and marketing, business administration, human and personal development, branch expansion, amongst others. Mrs. Kai, it's, a, it's an honor to welcome you to this webinar. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on the webinar today. Uh, thank you very much, Kai. Now we'll have a, a, a moderator by excellence uh, who will anchor this event. Is no less a person than Ms. Abiola Adekoya. Abiola, as we fondly call her, is a leading wealth and finance expert with about 10 decades of experience working in leading financial services firms across the globe. Ms. Adekoya was the MD CEO of RMB Nigeria Stockbroker, the subsidiary of the First Run Group, which is a leading financial services firm in Africa with global footprints. In her role, Kai managed the establishment of RMBNS in Nigeria, ensuring regulatory and global best practices were adopted. However, prior to this role, she was the MD of FBN Quest Securities, the subsidiary of FBN uh, First Bank of Nigeria Holdings PLC, uh, successfully repositioning the business as a top five stockbroking firm. Between 2006 and 2013, she worked at CSF Stockbrokers and Renaissance Capital and leveraged her knowledge and insight of the capital market and managerial skills to drive product innovation, build a high performance team to position the business favorably. Via her key social platforms, Kai provides wealth management insights by leveraging her extensive experience in investment and knowledge of the domestic and global economic landscape. She's passionate about mentoring young professionals, and with her work of experience, she provides guidance on being an entrepreneur. Ms. Kai, Ms. Um, Viola, it's an honor to welcome you to this uh, webinar. Thank you very much. So, so at this point, um, I will hand over proceedings to Mrs. Adekoya to set the tone for the day's discussions and provide the necessary guidance on the shift and procedure for the webinar. But before doing so, permit me to take our participants uh, through some housekeeping thoughts. Uh, we expect <coughs> that participants uh, will participate actively uh, in this webinar and to share their thoughts, experiences, and views on the subject of this webinar. Wise Mr. Dekoya will lead us through the pool uh, sessions and also moderate the event. We humbly request that participants uh, to drop their views on today's subject uh, in the comment section. Participants are also welcome to drop their questions for the participants, uh, for the panelists using the questions icon, and we would try our best to ensure that their queries and requests are attended to. We look forward to having an educative, insightful, and enriching session as we hand over the day's proceedings to Mr. Dekoya. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chinedu, for that um, wonderful introduction. Um, I, would, I dare say when DSL set this topic, they had no idea 
that um, it was going to rain because the topic says a rainy day is upon us. Surely everyone, if you were present in Nigeria, you're maybe in Lagos, it definitely rained today. So yes, a rainy day is absolutely upon us. Um, the topic that we are going to talk about today is pretty much focused on themes that have been recurring in the last couple of months and everyone is not, has not been immune to it. You know, we've heard words like emergency fund being thrown around, what's your investment profile, you know, the conversations around income loss. People are certainly grappling with the reality of the situation that we're in. Most importantly, they're also grappling with the impact that has on their finances. But today with my two esteemed panelists, we're going to answer all your questions. I've said, I have some tough questions to ask them on your behalf. I'm gonna be asking them and they're able to do justice to the questions that we'll be asking you, that we'll, that we'll be asking from them today. And on that note, I'd like to welcome everyone to this you know, esteemed webinar organized by DCSL, which is titled Financial and Wealth Management, The Rainy Day is Upon Us. And I'm gonna hand over to my panelists um, ladies first, I'm not partial, I'm just being fair. Kai, please, um, you know, give us a one minute, um, would I say, um, intros, intro on, on what you um, hope to share with us today. Okay, so it's really, okay, it's really just about the spread of, um, you know, how the COVID-19 has changed the global landscape. I think I'm echo. Sorry about that. I had an echo in the background, just wanted to sort it out. So, you know, we've seen the spread of COVID-19 and how it has changed the um, global landscape and is affecting financial, social environment, the professional life. And so there's a lot of disruption. There's a sudden disruption, which it has caused, and there's a lot of crisis, um, which is presenting so many economic challenges and a lot of um, tension, if you will, in the, in the environment. So while some factors are affecting financial well-being, and some of these factors, to be honest, maybe uh, we can say they're beyond our control. Um, but we feel today, and as an opening for me, is that financial knowledge can help people better manage their finances through these tough times and hardships. So we are here today to provide that much needed um, financial knowledge, you know, just to help people have more information. You know, so we hear that the majority of individuals are living one crisis away from financial disasters. And um, it's not just only for low income earners, but it cuts, cuts across even people who are living, you know, people who have higher paychecks, right? They receive more money, but at the end of the day, a lot of people, when we see this kind of downtimes like the COVID impacts, we see a lot of negative impacts. And so um, it all affects people in a negative way. So today is really about the information, the positive information that, you know, we would like to provide just to encourage people or to help people, you know, reposition themselves and look to taking on more opportunities that would help them just in a nutshell for an introduction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kai. Well said. Um, Tola, over to you. Um, he's a erudite scholar in, on this panel, and I know that he definitely has an opening remark like no other. Uh, okay. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. Uh, well, it's no longer news that virtually everybody, every organization has had uh, some negative impacts of COVID-19. My contribution is going to be in an area that I've spent the better part of my uh, professional and academic career on and it's on performance measurements. Uh, essentially, I want to use a three-line model to uh, explain performance measurement. Two of these lines are very common and people try to make comments on them every now and then. What are these three lines? The first line is the usual top line top line, let's grow our top line, let's grow our top line. Then of course, bottom line, bottom line. We should not forget that the middle line is also uh, a great uh, impact uh, uh, designer in what happens to your uh, top line 
as well as your uh, bottom line, which is the uh, uh, line that deals with the expenses or what we call costs sometimes. So my discussion is going to be, what do we need to do now uh, to ensure that we manage our costs the right way? So that at the end of the day, our target uh, bottom line uh, will be achieved and where it is not achieved now, is going to be achieved tomorrow. And I'm going to be philosophical and strategic about this. That is my initial uh, take. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hola. That was very nice in, um, you know, insight that you provided us. Now, before we go further, I just wanted to let the, uh, the audience know that it's going to be an interactive session. And I am going to launch a poll that I'm going to give you some time to answer. Now, this poll is going to enable us, you know, put some context into the conversation that we're going to be having today. Uh, you probably need about one minute max in, to answer this poll, and I'm launching it right now. Please feel free to answer as um, honestly as you, can, as you possibly can, and we'll, you know, we look forward to tackling the feedback from this poll during this session. So I'm happy to read the first question out to you if you, if you can't see it. Um, you know, there's a, to what extent has the global pandemic affected your ability to meet financial obligations? Um, you can vote, you can choose whether to a large extent, to a limited extent, or not at all. And then, do you have sufficient savings? I don't know if, anyone, if everyone can see the poll. Oh, we, we, we can see it, we can see it. Okay, okay, great. Okay, so the results are trickling in. And there's also a question here that I like, you know, do you have sufficient savings to, su to sustain you through the pandemic if it remains with us for another six months? I'm hoping that that doesn't happen. I'm sure everybody can share my sentiments on that. And current monthly income and expense pattern. And this is an interesting one. I'm going to actually delve a bit more into that because we, we, everyone assumes that because we're not going out, our expenses have shrunk. I tell you that that's not the case. I don't know, I don't know about anyone else, but my data bill has gone up astronomically. I think it's even cheaper to go around with my card than even using my data. So I don't know what you guys think about that. You know, I'm spending more on data. I mean, all the, all the networks are making a lot of money off of me. And then passive income. So passive income essentially says, you know, what some forms of income do you have? Do you have stocks? Do you have real estate investment, savings, mutual fund? I say a lot of savings here. And then you know, it'll be nice, it'll be nice to get all the data in. I'm gonna give everyone one more minute because we don't have a lot of time. I'm just trying to get at least 70% of the people voting. So once I have that number, I'm going to have to uh, shut the poll down. I think we're looking good. Um, 10 more seconds, if you haven't responded. 10 more seconds. We do the ultimate countdown. So seven, six, five, four, three, two. And I think that's the end of that. So I'm, I've ended the poll. I'm gonna share the results with everyone just so we can see what that looked like. Half of you, you know, about half of you are saying that, you know, the um, pandemic has affected your ability to meet your financial obligations. 48% of you say it has. 42% say, you know, it's been limited. And the lucky 10% says, you know, they're living the complete, uh, they're living the good life. It hasn't really impacted them so much. That's fantastic. That means you have a very strong financial plan. The second question, do you have sufficient savings or emergency funds to sustain you? A lot of people, 7% of people that answered said no. That's a big concern. And I think um, Kai will help us tackle that. Well, 33% say yes, they're fine. And again, the third question, based on your current income, how long can your investment portfolio sustain you? Um, a lot of people here are saying, you know, less than three months. Again, the emergency fund, we need to look at that. We need to talk more about that. And then some have said four to six months. Only 
um, very few, about 13% said less than a month, and only about 25% have said more than six to 12 months. And there are some, 4% who have no savings at all. Um, we'll definitely let you know you can start saving. There's no right or wrong time to start. And then the final um, poll I was asking, which forms of passive income do you have? 71% overwhelmingly in savings. We're going to talk to Kai about that. Is savings really the way to go? Because the return from savings now has been quite low. So we're going to talk to Kai about that. And we're going to engage in, you know, provide solutions to those that are heavy savings and not enough investment assets. And so with that, we start our conversation for today. Um, is the poll still showing? No, it's not. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, Todd, I'm going to start with you. Cost, cost, cost. Cost has been, you know, an area where people are, have been saying, well, you need to maybe cut down on your cost. We need to find ways of, you know, reducing our cost so we can stay afloat. Is that something that you think is possible in this situation that we're in? Like I mentioned, my cost has not, has not gone up, you know, because I, I mean, my cost, would have, one would have thought my cost would remain flat or at the best go, you know, be lower. But the reality is that even though I'm not spending money on petrol, I'm spending money on data. So is it really possible for cost to go down? Now that's one, two. I'm also spending money on infrastructure. Now because I'm not in my office, which is set up for me to be comfortable, I'm having to maybe buy more diesel. I'm having to maybe have, I have to have, bad, you know, I've had to buy <clears throat> Later. Maybe the children are printing a bit more. I'm buying paper. These are things I didn't put, I didn't think was going to be involved in my cost plan for 2020. But unfortunately, that has become my reality. Is it possible to actually cut costs fully in this era? Oh, okay. Thank you very much for that question. And uh, I would like to start by quoting uh, Lord Kelvin who was uh, a 19th century English physicist. Uh, he said, and I quote, if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. If you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. Uh, I will want to say without any regret that many of us do not measure our costs. Many of us do not know why we are spending what. And when the top line is growing in an upward direction, you would not feel the impact. But now more than ever before, the reading day has come. And the top line is seriously challenged because the creator and the givers of the top line uh, upstream, they can no longer buy your goods or services. So no revenue. So you don't have a choice than to have a second look at your cost. And like I said before, uh, I want to talk to us in a way where we can manage our cost the right way. I struggle to listen to or use the word cut cost because in the process of cutting a particular cost, you may cut a bigger revenue that that cost generates. So the philosophy and the thinking is for us to start looking at what I will call good costs and bad costs. Costs that support your strategic initiatives. Costs that are sunk or known towards attainment of your corporate objective and your individual objective. So it's not about I throw a coin add up the cost stays uh, till the cost goes. That's not the way it is done. So if you don't know how you got to the present cost profile, I am afraid you may have a hard time uh, cutting the cost. I have seen a number of organizations and individuals that slam some percentage uh, ranging from zero to 100% on salaries uh, as if that is the right way to do. Did they do any serious study to know who should be uh, given what percentage. And in the process, they must have lost some of their good hands. So in response to this question, I want to discuss five main themes that I think is what we should continually look at for us to have a good management of cost. Uh, the first one is that uh, 
we must never divulge our cost from our strategy. There is a nexus between strategy and cost. Your cost profile should be a reflection of your strategic option. That is uh, the first point. And uh, you must also continually rethink of your cost in terms of capabilities rather than the conventional functional approach that we try to use. So what is this person's capability? What is it that this particular asset is bringing to the table? That is the kind of asset we must continually maintain. Otherwise, we will not be able to achieve uh, the objective that we set for ourselves. Then also, it's very important for us to be proactive. You must create a, for a continuous cost management mindset. A continuous cost management mindset. Uh, Total is one of the greatest and uh, uh, sustainable uh, partner to uh, Lagos Business School. One thing I learned from Total over the years that we have been uh, uh, providing lectures for them is that they encourage every of their manager to have uh, uh, a commercial mindset. And they broke that commercial mindset into three themes. Number one, quality. Number two, cost optimization and also time. If you don't take all of this into consideration, you are going to run into problem. Then uh, the other point that I also want to mention is that uh, we, must all, we must all practice zero basing. We must practice zero basing. Put all your costs the way they are now into the conventional parking lots and let every one of them justify why you should continually carry them, otherwise jettison them. Realize that you have a number of costs that contribute toward the bottom line, that sustain your business model. Yet, you also have a lot that is just, just there. Like uh, our business school says, we are transiting from the brick and uh, mortar into online, online uh, training. Look at pictures all over the place. For example, in educational institution where all the brick and mortar are there in the last 60 days or so, contributing nothing and perhaps delving into the bottom line of school. So it's time to have a rethink, a re-strategizing, and uh, 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 I know change is a big problem, but whether we like it or not, change we must. So in summary, for now, uh, my position is that as it is now, there is hardly not so much you can do. You must accept the reality of the situation and is the proverbial reversal to the Maslow hierarchy of needs. You must come out from the I, I, I sky up there and come down and realize your present situation. Perhaps you may not start thinking about tomorrow, what happens to me tomorrow, but the way it is now is the way when we say, may I not be put to shame. If shame comes, you will say, may I not die. If you see death facing you, the next thing is that, may I not go to the uh, other side of heaven so that I will see it in my Lord. So that is what I want to say for now. So strategy, you, strategy, <laughs> cost management in the strategic way. Thank you very much, Tola. And just to give a quick recap of what Tola has said, I think the first thing he mentioned was you must measure it. So a lot of us struggle with budgeting. I do. I have a method that I use. Um, but a lot of us struggle with budgeting. Um, a lot of us, you know, you know, just try and reduce cost without itemizing whether the cost we have is it good or is it bad. And then he also mentioned about goal setting. So are you setting your goals? And when you set your goals, are you um, ensuring that the goals that you set are aligned with the costs that you're incurring, or are you just setting goals and you're incurring costs in another, in another venture entirely? Now, in talking about goal setting, I'm going to move to Kai and ask a question, especially on the, you know, one of the key things, key things that was thrown out in the, in the poll, which is emergency fund. Kai, it seems like over 70% of people that are on this call do not have enough, do not have any emergency fund, and it, 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 it does seem like about 50% um, of them only have funds that are going to sustain them for the next one to three months. How can we start building an emergency fund if we don't have any at all? Is this the right time to start? Over to you. Okay, so let me just thank you so much. Thank you so much, Biola. I'll just start by just giving a background around the savings and emergency fund, um, funds. So savings and emergency funds really it provides us free debt free um, it provides a debt free means to withstand financial shocks you know in times like this you know where we have a 
job losses and unforeseen events. We see that some companies are cutting salaries by half, um, you know, just even laying and ask, laying out and asking people to go. Um, however, for many people, the emergency fund is not capable of covering emergencies, which is what we saw from the poll, right? And uh, this means that a lot of people are living in an extremely risky predicament. And every household really should have enough emergency savings to cover um, at least three to six months worth of their bills and expenses. So the present economic realities have shown that some people are really quite vulnerable and may need to save more, um, you know, just even from self employed people, single parents, couples with one income and, you know, contract workers, you know, it, so the scope is wide. So saving at least 10 percent from each monthly income is recommended. However, this can be increased periodically to cater for changes such as rises in the cost of living or additional financial obligations. So we, we, we sort of um, uh, postulate that, you know, you start from around at least 10% every month. And in a period of unexpected economic downturn, definitely you see cash reserves in savings and emergency funds can help people meet their financial obligations and they can run to it. So what we pretty much do uh, at um, ARM Investment Managers, we use a model for financial planning. And this model is really a methodology that helps you to insulate your financial plans against external shocks, such as, you know, the kind of current circumstances that we have. So yes, emergency funds are very important. Even at this time, you know, it's something that, you know, we need to pay attention to. So how it works, you know, the structure we um, advise people to work with is to align your goals with the right investment instruments. So your goals are very, very critical, even at this time. You know, so what would be your goals in the year 2020? Because you have them. The season, it's a season, right? We may just wake up one day and find out that the, the COVID is gone. So your financial goals and your financial plans need to, you know, you need to have them, you need to have clarity with them. So align your goals with the right investment instruments, which I'll talk about in a bit, and keep abreast of relevant information. Stay disciplined. So it is important that clients, you know, for us eventually, as you start the, you know, we start with the planning and getting your goals right. Um, we use matrix such as your age um, to determine how you should plan, what you should be planning about. So the younger you are, the more long-term investment instruments you should be willing and able to invest in. Um, another factor is also the risk tolerance. You need to identify your risk appetite. For example, um, is your risk appetite, are you low risk, uh, medium risk, or high risk? How much risk can you take that will expose you to what particular savings or investment instruments, right? Then what are your liquidity needs? For instance, um, how much would you be needing per time? So make provisions for your liquidity needs as you plan your portfolios. That's something on in your investments. That's one of the things, you know, the, the strategies that we apply. And also um, your investment objective, you know, so even in the COVID, what are your plans? Because we have plans. Just because the economy is downturn doesn't mean our plans have gone away. We have plans. It's just how we're managing our plans and staying through and, you know, riding through the tide. And then the time horizon, how long are you settling? Are you setting the funds aside, you know, for and how, what is the, what, at what time would you need them? Would you be paying fees? after the COVID or even in another eventuality. So what would be the time horizon? Would you like to get married after this period? And what would be the plan? Okay, and then also you need to think about how your assets um, and liabilities match. So just really to ensure um, that you match the right assets. So for instance, when we finish all the planning and just helping you go through the financial plan is to really see what assets would fit so you can, um, you can, carry out your goal and we identify it um, against your liabilities or your goals. And there are also tax considerations and um, investment constraints. So for instance, if there's a religious um, angle to it in terms of, uh, you know, so religious angle or personal limitation that would stop you, maybe morals that would not allow you to invest or ethical stance that would not allow you to, to take some particular product. So all of these things come together, but the aim of it is really to create for you financial stability. And what I'm saying here now is that early planning is important towards achieving financial stability. And it's easy and it's possible for you to start with a plan. Um, 
you can sow. You start that out by breaking down your goal into short term, medium and long term. And then, of course, you can invest them in the right instrument, like I have already said. Your, 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 you need to set your short, mid and long term goals and then your financial milestones in order for you to now craft a strategy with the help of a financial planner, for instance, to help you work through them. So in a nutshell, you need that, um, you need that savings, you need, um, you need the emergency funds. And even at this time, it will still help, especially for people listening to me who still have that paid employment and the opportunity is there. By all means, it is important that you set aside something, you know, no matter how small. And the processes which I went through around how we help you go through starting a, a financial plan. Okay. Thank you very much, Kai. I'm still going to stay with you. And so okay. you mentioned, you know, I'm, I'm very glad that you mentioned, you know, having a financial <laughs> plan. And you talked about, I think you kind of alluded to the fact that it doesn't matter if you don't have an emergency fund now. You can't start now, even if you're employed. I think one thing I also noticed in that poll was that a lot of people have savings, which is very different from investment. People think that savings and investment are the same. They're not the same. Savings is just cash sitting in your account where you're probably earning little or no interest. In this case, given that we're in a three, you know, we're in the very low digit um, interest rate, interest era mm -hmm. of three to 1%. So it means that you're probably earning next to nothing. Now for those sort of people, um, Kai, would you advise them to have a portfolio? And if you were going to advise them to have a portfolio um, of investment of investment asset, what should they chase? Should they chase returns or should they chase safety? Okay, so uh, should, they, should they chase returns or should they chase safety? So, I mean, first of all, to... they will invest their cash because they all have, it seems like a lot of people have cash in their accounts and they're just smiling and happy to see the cash. But the reality is that the cash is not offering much returns and inflation is at 12%. So what should they do? Invest it, and if they invest returns, or you know, should they focus on returns or safety? You know, that struggle. Okay, so I'll take it from the top, right? So um, really, what investment options are available? Um, you know, and then if you decide to come into investments, would you be a portfolio, or would you chase returns, or um, would you chase returns, right? Yes. Okay, so uh, just to say that, yes, the, the, because of the pandemic, and even now, we see that the equities market has declined significantly. And it presents a lot of opportunities to have, uh, to, to have some exposure to the stock market. So historically, I'll just give a background. Equities have survived depressions, recessions, and, you know, um, in, the, in times past, corrections in the past, and they'll survive in the future. So all investment options available now have been available then and more are coming on board. What is important to be clear, and I'll always go back to that, is to be clear on your goals and you know, align this with the right investment instrument. So um, I try not to treat it as a one-stop shop element, but for people who have minimum amounts, starting from as little as 5,000, you have the option of getting right into a mutual fund, right? So the mutual fund gives you more opportunities, it gives you more leverage, and it gives you um, an opportunity to earn, uh, to earn income as you progress. So sometimes you get income um, staggered through the course of the year. So you can start with minimum amounts versus having your funds in a savings account, which gives you a little bit uh, a lower amount. So right, the opportunities are there for you to earn more through a mutual fund. However, if you have larger funds, now speaking to your second part of your question around the portfolio. Um, so if you have larger, larger funds available to you, for some institutions, it depends and it cuts across, funds from about 50 million and 100 million and upwards, you can start a portfolio, a portfolio of different assets. And I'll go back to it is, and explain this, that we use the financial planning model, which really helps you to understand where you are in your life journey. So it's not, um, it's not sporadic, it's, not, um, it, it, it's progressive that you, today you're 25 years old and at a point you become 35 or 40 and 50 and then you go on, you, you even retire from maybe the civil service and then you live up to your 80. So what we try to do is to speak to the entire journey, which is the life journey. We call it in our own model, the life circle plan, which is what we use. So it's really around identifying where you are. I'm, I'm really um, emphasizing this because should you, the, the approach is different versus just bringing uh, a 10,000 and just saying, I want to start to invest. Identifying where you are 
on your journey. It helps you to have a longer outlook. It helps you to have a, a longer approach to how you invest and plan. So you know it's a journey. It's not a one-off quick fix thing. So even if you start with a money market fund because you are looking for more returns and which is available even now, perfect. You can start there, but absolutely find time to speak with a financial advisor and find out what will be your journey. What is, how old are you? What is your time horizon? What are your plans? What are, what are, um, how much money would you need in 10 years? Would you need to be married? Would you have a family of three? What would be your expenses? Will there be another emergency like we have seen in 2020? And then how do you cater for that? So really, um, I would just say, you know, in addition to that, that um, regardless of your source of income, your needs will always be unique. So everyone is different. So we treat, um, you know, each person uniquely. So in determining your asset allocation strategy for us, it depends on your cash flow, your objectives, your time horizon, your risk tolerance, and much more, like I have mentioned. However, for a salary earner who gets a fixed income monthly, it implies that your investments and expenses have to be managed strictly. So let me speak to the, to the spectrum where, you know, non-business owners, people who work for people and you have, you know, you, you have a salary that comes to you and not that you own your own business, for instance. This implies that um, your investments and expenses have to be managed strictly and, you know, according to what you have. So then comes your risk appetite and your, your risk appetite of tolerance, um, which is likely to, you know, to be low because, you know, you don't, want, you don't have the opportunity to take so much risk. Um, then your risk tolerance will also determine the type of investments that, you know, will be preferred or, you know, advised for you. Um, this also depends on the, your clients, the age of the clients, the, the stage in the financial life cycle, like I just said, the circumstance, the final financial situation, the investment of your time horizon, I'm mentioning and I'm just sort of re-emphasizing. So younger clients tend to have a longer time horizon and ability to take more risk. And on the other hand, older clients will definitely have a shorter investment time horizon and can make some losses. So they have time to make losses. So for those kinds of clients, we can now say, okay, start an investment in equity. So you may even have 20, 30 years for any recoveries like we're seeing even at this time or we saw in a few years ago, 2008 and yes. in other yes. years, right? Yes. So um, they have a long, they have enough time to sort of recoup. So in that case, the risk tolerance of the older person will be less than those of the younger folks. Again, the more cash reserve and insurance cover people have, the more their propensity to take risk. So you know, um, we, we always don't just want to advertise that, oh, put your money in a mutual fund. We try to ask you to check through your journey, your financial journey. Where are you um, at the journey? What do you want to achieve? Where are you going to? What is your 10 year, 20 year, 20, 30 year plan? Your long term plan? What would you like to do in retirement? And so we take you through the plan. And based on that, we look at your profiling and then we now decide to begin to distribute your assets. It's a more um, organized structure for us and you know that's somehow what how we approach it okay thank you very much kai um there's a question here about what is risk appetite uh, and i was just trying to type it in but i typed it into the wrong place I, and it, basically your risk appetite is how much money you're willing to to make or lose right so if for example you're someone that is willing to go in all um, to go all in and you know take it and invest in something and you don't mind if you lose it or you don't mind if you lose half you don't mind if you lose some that tends to um, decide how you know decide your risk appetite how much you're willing to lose or gain based on how much you put down determines your risk appetite there's a measure there's a, there's some metrics that you can use to measure it and if you go online you can see that um, so I'm, I'm going to come to you so the reality is that is it possible you know, our needs are increasing. I mentioned to you, I said our needs are increasing, right? So I am not, I'm at home, my diesel uh, cost is going up, my um, data cost is going up, and the other costs are going up. Is it possible to continue to cut costs entirely, um, you know, in the light of static income? You've already mentioned that, but I think what we really want to also know, how do they manage it? How can we, maybe not cut it, but is there a way to manage the cost that we're seeing? Or do we just have to absorb okay. all the costs? Is there a way oh, that we okay. to manage that? Okay. Uh, yeah. What? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for that question. Uh, I said one thing earlier, which is about what you do not measure, you cannot manage. I also 
advocate for the fact that our cost profile is a reflection of our choices. Costs that we incur, either at the individual or organizational level, is a reflection of our choices. Mm. And therefore, if you can no longer uh, fund or finance your current tastes and uh, 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 your current taste and uh, level of uh, uh, life, nobody should tell you to, to take a second look. I, and I think now more than ever before, it's just that COVID-19 is the way it is, something that is already pointing also in direction of COVID-19. For us to do a rethink, a re-evaluation of our being, and how we are going to survive individually and at the organizational level is uh, the fact we need to unlearn many of the things that we have learned before and learn new things. We have yeah. to come down from our, from our uh, tower up there and face the reality. So if you are not going to get, if you are not going to get any, anything about your top line, in the next uh, uh, couple of months or so, then nobody will tell you to do a revision. Uh, something that uh, uh, Kai said, which I support, which is something that I also got right from the time I was at PwC. And when I visited uh, Spain in 2014, I will take that 2014 first before it's a short one. I met a professor during that particular uh, visit. And he said one thing, he said, if he has a business school cut his salary by half, he wasn't going to resign. And what I learned in my younger days is the fact that if you work for three years or four years, you should be able to stay an extra year with that job before you start complaining. Mm -hmm. And if you take the three year uh, example, what that means is that three year salary should do you in four years. If you divide okay. three by four, it's seventy-five percent, which means okay. you have no business money more than seventy-five percent of your uh, annual year yeah. before you start becoming a beggar. I, I think okay. we indulge ourselves too much on okay. on uh, uh, non-value adding expenses Expen and expenditures yeah. that yeah. Uh, this has now brought it to the fore. For like, for example, a family of uh, four, uh, husband, wife, two children, the four of them will go to church or mosque or party in four different cars. Now nobody will tell you that uh, you have to uh, arrange for yourselves to go at the same time. You have three, four, five neighbors stay on the same, on the same uh, uh, road. They, they live on the same, uh, uh, in the same, uh, 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 in the same space, right? And they go to the office, five of them, four of them, in different cars at all the time. So and somebody said something that was very, very destructive. Uh, a, 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 an ex-governor, he was just he was just saying that oh, over the period of sixty days that he has been at home, he did not wear more than four clothes, four sets of clothes put together. Absolutely. And this man has dozens and dozens and dozens. We have acquired so much irrelevancies, so much items, that, and it's no longer business as usual. The Absolutely. earlier everybody faces the reality, and you Better. bring this reality in your way of life. Either at the individual level or the organizational level, the better for all of us. Okay, Prof. Thank, uh, I, I need to have to cut you. We have barely 10 minutes more and a lot of questions people are asking. So, um, Kai, are you there? Uh, there's a question here for you. Um, I, I do have a couple more questions, but I think we're, we're fast spent on time. And so, Kai, a question here for you. Someone asked that since your risk tolerance is determined by your age and other factors, um, how much would you advise a 50-year-old person to stay and set aside? I don't know if something that you can answer on this platform, but if you can give some guidance to that, that would be very helpful. How much would you um, ask a 50-year-old person to save and set aside? And so there are many factors. Like I mentioned, age would affect you, your time horizon. Even at 50, what would you like to do and what are your plans and what are your goals? And what would you like to achieve at past 50, you know, the number of children you have, the number of your responsibility and your dependents, all these factors feed into 
um, how much you're able to. So again, um, the, the income, your current income is also another, um, if I advise you today to say, start your investments with 500,000 and then you are not able to start with 500, I haven't done you justice. So remember I mentioned something for the person who asked that question, um, it's not a one size fits all, but I usually would, what we usually advise is walk into one of our investment centers and by all means speak to an investment advisor who will now take you through and determine what it is, what are your objectives and what would you like to do. So for a 50 year old person, I would not be able to tell you start with, a 50 year old may be able to start with 10,000, another 50 year old may be able to start with 100,000, another person would be able to start with a million, you know, so again, it's not one size fits all. However, we look at it in totality. So somebody who may not have so many dependents and have uh, then have so much disposable income may be able to put aside more depending on where they find themselves and what the objectives are. So um, I'd like that person to sort of contact um, me through any of the channels on, and then we can guide them further. Okay, Kai, let me ask you a question of my own. So there's a lot of, um, you know, focus on agribusiness because of the returns that it offers. I mentioned some are offering about 25 to 30%. Should people be looking at these sort of investment options? I mean, there are, I mean, there are some reputable ones. Would you, I mean, would you say they should look at it? And if they should look at it, what percentage of their portfolio would you advise that they would put in those sort of ventures? Okay, so um, diversifying assets, right? and having a multiple mix of assets is something that we tend to sort of, it's the approach we have. Um, it is important again that we look at the individual and what their objectives are. If for instance you have, your, your objective is in the long term to go into agriculture, um, you, you know, so your profiling also meets it. So we have some people who are shy of um, some investments because of the religious undertone, they tend to sort of speak more into investments. Profile, how much risk are you willing to be the risk and going to uh, um, agriculture because also it's long term. So you have to be patient. So you have to be patient to ride through the, the, the difficulties that you may have in the course of trying to um, if you've decided to adopt an agriculture fund or investment, there are risks in all of this. So um, the, the, to the answer again is not one size fits all. And I'm very careful to say, okay, you know, put a certain percentage in agriculture. It has to do with the total mix of your, uh, the area of options available to you, to you, speaking to your age, your horizon, um, how much money you set aside, how much money you're able to save. Um, you know, if you want to go into agriculture, is that, is that if you want to invest in agriculture, it probably will speak to your profile and what you want to achieve. So how much, can, how much of your portfolio are you going to invest 100% just because somebody says agriculture is good, but you also need available cash. So what we will do for you is to guide you to see how you will still need a money market fund, which is a near cash instrument that will still give you access to liquidity because the agricultural investment may be a long-term one and your returns may not be as fast and as quick as possible. So it's a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a balancing system, right, that we sort of apply to help you overall, you know, balance out and not that, you know, you take this because it's, it's the fixed, do this because it's at 25%. We, so we have to look at it along the entire spectrum. All right. Thank you very much, Kai. Um, um, Tal, I have a question for you. So now in the face of... Um, uh, you know, people having credits that they have to, you know, credit obligations to banks, um, some by some, you know, to uh, microfinance um, banks as well. How do you think they should approach it? Should people go back to the banks and go and negotiate? Because that's a huge part of the cost that some people are carrying. Some people have mortgages, they have car loans, they have personal loans that they have taken in the hopes that things are going to, you know, um, pick up in this, in 2020 and in this economy. But unfortunately, that hasn't been the case. So what would you advise? Would you advise them to go back to their banks and maybe renegotiate some of these loans? And if they were going to renegotiate, what would you think, what, what three things would you advise them to say to the banks to be able to get the renegotiation done? Okay, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, I think it is, uh, or it is not one story for all. Everybody has a different story to tell, depending on your age, depending on your 
expectation for the future. But more importantly, you must be calm and don't lose your health and sanity. Be courageous that uh, this is just a phase that will soon go away. And be ready to lose some of your assets. You can always go back and regenerate these assets tomorrow. If after discussing with the bank and they are not uh, understanding your plight, I think you have to, you have to take uh, uh, a safety net by perhaps calling the asset and defraying the loan so that you can have your head back and uh, re-strategize. But by and large, uh, globally, you have seen, and even at the national level, the banks are also not unaware of what is going on. The CPA has sometimes advocated for reduction or complete uh, 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 interest for giving for individuals and some corporates. I think and it's also in my school's cooperative, we have had to suspend deduction of uh, uh, people's uh, cooperative commitment. Uh, because even for the, for the financiers and the lenders, uh, the, the, the borrowers have to be alive for them to be able to have uh, uh, a possibility of correcting their fund and also Absolutely. not to send the wrong signals to the would-be debtor of tomorrow. I think, but more importantly, I think it's better for them to go and re renegotiate and refinance rather than for the lender to be chasing them about. Be bold about it and uh, don't, don't lose uh, your health, okay? It's not your, it's not your, it's not, you are not only in this, it's a global pandemic and the impact will go away uh, sooner than we expect. Okay, some people are asking a couple of questions. How does one start investing with ARM? So uh, I'm going to allow Ms. Oga to reply that, but not yet in your rounding up comments because we have just about four minutes left. And how realistic, and somebody is asking, so in Prof, so I'm going to group Prof's um, question and Kai's question together. Now for, for Prof, somebody is asking you, and I want to include this in your closing remarks, how realistic is it for you not to spend more than 75% of your total income in a year with our extended family context. So Prof, you're gonna add that to your closing remarks. And secondly, how do you apply cost management principles to a declining income, particularly when you're faced with COVID-19 and the realities of redefining your working capital? As I mentioned, new levels of working capital have come up as well. And for Kai, um, some, a question that has been raised to you is, how does one start investing with ARM and uh, somebody wants to be an investment banker and is asking you, how can they do that? I guess they're shooting their shots. And someone else is asking, is investing in shares a good option if they had 130,000 Naira net income? So I'm going to ask um, um, Tola to start and with his closing remarks. Tola, you have one minute. I'm going to try, I'm going to, I'm going to put you on the timer here. You have one minute okay. to your closing remarks. All right, oh, very, very good. Ah. 75% is just one possibility. It could be 60%, like Kai said. Kai said 10%. So, but the thing is just that don't spend 100% of your, of your fund because of the raining day. And it's always better to fix the roof while the, the sun is still on. Uh, in my closing remark, I would advise people to always connect their cause to their strategy retain costs in terms of capabilities, do zero basing, be sustainable in your thinking, and lastly, we must have a culture of continuous cost management. It has to be a mindset, continuous cost management, so that uh, uh, you do not spend money on bad costs items. Uh, spend more on the good cost item for you to achieve your individual and corporate uh, goals in a sustainable manner and consult when you are not competent okay. to handle the situation. Exactly, uh, Tala is asking you to reach out to him. If you need any help, Tala is asking that he's available, reach out to him, he's available as a professional to assist you with your individual and your company cost management. Um, Kai, over to you, one minute. We are, we're doing well on time, Prof, um, Prof did well. One minute, Kai. So to quickly round up and you know, we can't hear you. Okay, there are options. You can either download the forms online, you can go to the investment center, um, you know, and speak to an advisor. But for the, for the very um, um, IT survey ones, you can also um, download our, our app. It's called it's the ARM PD Investor Application. You can, that allows you to, to actually start your investments in a very, you know, small amount and, you know, um, let them go quickly. 
So those are the uh, three options right there. I, um, the other one was how to, um, um, the, the person speaking about being an investment. Sorry, Viola, I missed that. I know there was a question. I think investment wants to join ARM. Ah, okay, okay. So um, that's interesting because some people may not only be, um, may not, they have grown through different, um, through different platforms where they, you know, they've done different jobs and then come through. But there are certain certifications, again, that allows you to stay ahead and gives you the opportunity to and then apply and join. Um, and there are many investment companies. And it's not just ours alone, but the opportunities are out there. So it's really around having the goal and the plan and you decide this is what you want to do. Certain certifications you can write, but I guess get into the right platform and start to work out in, in, one, of the, in, in one of the institutions that we have. Did I miss any question? Because I'm just running yeah, for stock time. Market, I heard that 30,000 Naira stock market here. 30 seconds, Sky. Heard that 30,000 Naira. The person wants to do the stock market. Should they do it? Yes or no? Yes, and it's possible. Have yes, we have remark. ARM. We have ARM, um, our, our sister company, which is ARM Securities. And okay. you're able to invest through that platform. And so, yes, it's, it's a possibility as well. Okay, Thank you. your closing remarks. So 30 seconds for that. You feel okay. free. I, I just want to say that, you know, some of these um, discussions seem very unrealistic and maybe it's like so far-fetched, but the reality is start with from where you are. And the basic easy way to really start from is by cutting out, and he's talked about cost management, really just cutting out, having a budget. That's so key to everything I've said. For you to save and start with 10% or 20% or 30%, you just have to have a budget, work from a budget. So cut out, you know, cut out a lot of things, especially now with the COVID, even though you said in the beginning that your cost is going up, you find out that there is a substitution. There are some things you can cut up and something you may absolutely need. So start with, if you can only start with 5,000, I say start with the 5,000 and find a way to grow it and be consistent with that pattern. You have to be consistent. You have to start, you have to be consistent, then start a plan. Tell yourself, if I have to do 5,000 a month, I'll do it. If, I, if it's 100,000 a month, I'll do it for one year, two years, 10 years. And there you begin to grow. And then we help you look into the different asset classes that meet your personality and your profile and hope, hopefully help you to set up a financial plan that works. It was a bit right. of washing through, but thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kai. We were trying to make it for five on the dot. I think we did five or two. We're not doing too badly on time. And you know, very a very big thank you to the to the panelists, um, Professor Akintola and Kai Oga. And you know, and also most especially a very warm thank you to the attendees. We couldn't have done this without you. This wouldn't have been successful without you. We do hope that we have given you enough insight and information to take advantage of the investment opportunities are available to you. And we, we also hope that we've also shared with you how you can start. I think the reality for, for most people here is that it is urgent. It is no longer far away. The future is now and it is urgent and we must take action. And as Kai and um, Tola have said, we must be consistent. We must manage all the top line and bottom line um, numbers that you have ignored in the last couple of months. They've come back to bite us in the face, but do not despair is what we're also seeing. There are options available there for you and there are opportunities for you to invest in. And we will pull through this together as one. And with that, I would wish all of you a very wonderful evening. Thank you very much to DCSL for setting this up. We really appreciate it. And to everyone that's been here, thank you very much and hope you did enjoy it. Have a good evening. Yeah. yeah thank you very much. Thank you very much, our panelists. And um, uh, um, the, the key advice here is connect your post to your strategy, you know? And um, it's been a great evening, I must confess, an uh, evening of ideas, truths, and decisive directions. Um, no doubt, our panelists and moderators have all exceeded our expectations and provided the insight we need in planning and managing our finances to ensure that we come out of the pandemic stronger and better. Just to remind us of the upcoming events and training uh, uh, programs uh, at the stable of this year's cell, we'll be hiring our company secretaries, some company secretaries and governance officers masterclass uh, in collaboration with the Hama Institute of Corporate Governance in Dubai uh, uh, on the 7th to 8th of June, 2020. We'll also be hiring the company secretaries and compliance officers master class scheduled for June 21st to 22nd, 2020. And then uh, our seminar on improving the performance of the audit committee is scheduled to hold on the 24th of June, 2020. And lastly, the director and boardroom dynamics uh, scheduled to hold on the uh, 26th of uh, June, 2020. 
We enjoin our participants and panelists to continue to follow us on our social media handles for details of our forthcoming webinars and to also follow us on our Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter handles. To remind us that this event was put together by DCSL Corporate Services. Um, we provide bespoke training uh, for directors, senior management, um, directors induction, board retreats, board evaluation, uh, codification of board charters, business advisory and regulatory compliance services, company secretarial services, and also company setup. We have been so pleased to have our panelists today. And um, special thanks to Professor Akitola Owolabi and Mrs. Kai Oga, and also our elegant moderator, Mr. Biola Adokoye. We hope that we have gained a lot of uh, a lot from this webinar and have been provided the necessary tools we need to face the new normal occasioned by the pandemic. I believe we are also ready to apply these lessons to our life and business activities. Uh, we welcome the participants to participate in our forthcoming webinars and events, uh, training programs later for the rest of the year. As Prof rightly noted, this is a phase that, we sh that shall soon pass away. We all pray that this pandemic, uh, pandemic will not last forever and that someday we we'll have to live our normal life together. So thanks for making out uh, time to participate uh, this webinar. We look forward to seeing you again in the coming weeks and wish you a pleasant evening. We'll sign out now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kai. See you again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Everybody.